Hola, buenos días. Eh, soy eh, Monse Bosch, periodista. Eh, bueno, quiero agradecer la invitación uh, de estar aquí. Rafa, en su primera introducción, ha explicado por qué es tan importante para el periodismo en estos momentos tener datos eh, para poder reflexionar. ¿no? Quería agradecer a uh, Contraborrado, no solamente el acto de hoy, sino todo el trabajo que están haciendo desde hace ya varios años. Eh, yo estaba en Gijón cuando en 2019 se convocó la, la Escuela Rosario Acuña eh, con la valentía de poner sobre la mesa públicamente algunos temas eh, que se venían trabajando en privado. ¿no? Eh, como periodista me parece fundamental que, que tengamos elementos para el debate, que tengamos datos y que como comunicadores y comunicadoras nos pongamos las pilas y no temamos... Eh, digamos, en, a la hora de confrontar, aún siendo conscientes de que la presión ambiental en estos momentos eh, política, sobre todo, eh, pues es considerablemente dura. ¿no? Reivindicó la libertad de pensamiento, de opinión y sobre todo la importancia de que, aparte de los sentimientos, eh, juzguemos y valoremos las cuestiones con datos, así que eh, es fundamental la, la jornada de hoy. Eh, antes de empezar, eh, bueno, recordaros que la próxima sesión, esta sesión, esta segunda mesa, eh, pues se va a manejar también en inglés, las dos intervinientes van a, van a hacerlo en inglés, y, y antes de, esa de esas dos intervenciones, vamos a ver un vídeo de Sharon Davis, nadadora y subcampeona olímpica de 1980. En 1980. Hi, I'm really sorry I can't be with you there today. Um, I know you have Linda and Emma uh, and Nicola and loads of amazing people who have been flying the flag for equality in women's sport for a very, very long time. And um, I feel very proud to say that they're amongst my friends. Thank you very much for all the hard work you do. Keep on going. I really feel like that we are getting somewhere now and that people are beginning to listen. And hopefully we can save a whole generation of young girls from going through what people of my generation went through when we lost medals that we, that we shouldn't have done. And uh, thank you very much. Have a good conference. Voy a presentar brevemente las uh, dos mujeres que van a intervenir. Una es Linda, Linda Blade, que nació en Cochabamba, Bolivia, eh, aunque es de Canadá. Eh, por cierto, que para intervenir, eh, lo va a hacer en directo, pues ha tenido que, bueno, más que madrugar seguramente habrá tenido que, que, que marcarse un tiempo para, para acostarse, ¿no? Eh, bueno, gracias Linda por el esfuerzo de horarios. Eh, ella es ex campeona de Epatlón y ha pasado 25 años como entrenadora profesional de rendimiento deportivo en Edmonton en más de 15 deportes. Linda ha trabajado con jugadores de la NHL, atletas olímpicos y en el programa Run Jump Throw de Athletics Canadá. Tiene un doctorado en kinesiología. En 2014 fue elegida presidenta de la Junta de Athletics Alberta, donde trabaja para revisar y contribuir en la política deportiva canadiense. A ver, un momentito. Eh, forma parte de la Safe Women Sports, una coalición que busca preservar los estándares de elegibilidad basados en el sexo para la participación en deportes femeninos. Es coautora, junto a la periodista Bárbara Kay, del libro cuyo título dará nombre a su ponencia Antideportivismo, cómo el transactivismo y la negación de la ciencia están destruyendo el deporte. Susana Bischoff uh, es alemana, eh, está especializada en psicosomática, eh, perdón, psicosomática, psiquiatría y adicción, es terapeuta deportiva y de ejercicio eh, de una clínica de rehabilitación. En 1982 fundó en Berlín Occidental el programa Cultura del Deporte y del Movimiento Feminista en la Práctica y, y la Teoría. 
Es cofundadora en 1988 de la antigua Asociación Deportiva de Mujeres y Lesbianas de Berlín. Eh, fue entrenadora de la selección femenina de Alemania en tenis de mesa en los Juegos Paralímpicos de Dublín 2003. Desde julio de 2013 vive en Kinshasa, en la República Democrática del Congo. Trabaja en cooperación al desarrollo como especialista integrada en un proyecto de mujeres. Y en su intervención, Susan nos acercará a la situación de Alemania, donde la presión de las asociaciones transactivistas, junto con los verdes, la izquierda y el FPD, los liberales, tienen cada vez más efectos en todos los ámbitos del deporte, sin que las condiciones para las mujeres y las niñas hayan mejorado en absoluto. Eh, pues eh, os dejo con las dos intervenciones. Can everybody hear me? Sí. Mm -hmm. Bienvenida. Oh. Gracias. Ok. Uh, gracias. Um, I am uh, now 3.15 a.m. Uh, so I hope that my eyes can stay open while I have this uh, opportunity. Thank you for having me. Um, as it was said, I am the president of Athletics Alberta, and um, I, in 2018, I was looking at a document that was being proposed by the Canadian authorities, Athletics Canada. I mean, we were supposed to be looking at gender inclusion in sport, and suddenly my mouth dropped open. I was so surprised because this article or this document was saying we should be uh, open to self-identification of a male into a woman's race. And I couldn't believe it. So um, the thing that bothered me the most was the, it was the Canadian Center for Ethics and Sport, which is our anti-doping, uh, anti-dopaje um, center that was telling us that we should allow a male into women's sports And we know that if you, you know, it's, it's so absurd because if you allow somebody to dope, they have maybe a nine to 10% advantage. If you put a male into women's sports, that's somewhere from 10 to 50% advantage. It seemed so contradictory that <laughs> this organization that's supposed to, to make sure that we are competing fairly was the one pushing this ideology. And I went home, I, I looked, I was so shocked. And I thought, well, I'm going to look up the Olympic policy because surely the International Olympic Committee policy must be better than this. And then that's when I was really very sad to find out that um, the, the Olympics also had betrayed women. They, they had allowed a, a policy in 2015 that a man could take you know, reduce the testosterone and be in women's sports. Um, it was very clear to me immediately that this was an ideological problem. It, it wasn't, I mean, people must know the difference between men and women. And, you know, a lot of times we've heard that now with uh, Fiona and John did wonderful work explaining the differences and explaining, explaining framing the problem. Um, for me, I will add something to the idea of advantage. Male advantage is one thing, but even if the male didn't have an advantage, there's the issue in sport on categories of design. You know, in, I was looking at sailboat races in the Olympic sailing, they have different design of boats. And even if, The, the body of the boat is off by a few centimeters, it's not valid to, to race that boat. Um, so we have different bodies, different structure, different design, different morphology. That's what we call sexual dimorphism, different morphology. So you don't put a Formula One race car into a NASCAR race. We have different categories because we're, we're made differently. So it's about advantage, but it's also about design. But I wanted to, to spend this time really explaining for me what's inspiring you know we can be very depressed about what's going on and it's terrible but it's also for me very inspiring to see 
people, individuals, you know, individuals who do something about this. Um, we know that the IOC and the NC2A in the United States, all these big organizations are not are not doing anything. They are they do not want to solve this problem. They think it's just too much, uh, uh, maybe just a nuisance, and they are not committed to to doing things right. It's very clear to me at this point. And so I want to take you on a quick journey. So there are signs of hope. And I feel like the um, resistance is coming from grassroots people, uh, from individuals in sport and like people who are brave, certain individuals in leadership that are going against the grain and maybe some independent organizations. So in 2019, we saw the USA Powerlifting, Dr. Chris Hunt um, stood up and would not allow the, their organization USA Powerlifting would not allow trans women, women, trans identified males to go into the powerlifting, even though international powerlifting would allow it. So they are standing up. And then there's uh, in my board of directors, also in Athletics Alberta in 2019, passed the policy that we categories on the basis of biology. If you're male, you're if you're born male, you always compete male. And then we have um, one of the biggest inspirations for me, and thank you, Fiona, was also Nicola Williams, Fair Play for Women. As soon as I met this problem in 2018 and I was looking around, immediately found Fair Play for Women on Twitter. I saw all of the work they were doing. I participated in the Women's Place UK event that Fiona talked about. And then we got into 2020 and we had the uh, Alliance Defending Freedom. The, there was a lawsuit in the United States on behalf of the girls in Connecticut. Um, you know, there were these boys in high school in the United States who amongst the two boys for over three seasons, they had amassed 15 state championships and, you know, only two, only two trans girls were able to displace and set like 15 state championships and displace 85 girls from having advancement opportunities. So. That thing that Fiona talked about where she said that some of the excuses are, well, there's only a few and who cares? Two, it took two. And there were all these things that happened to the girls. Um, and um, unfortunately, the Biden administration, uh, their federal, uh, go the fe federal government went against that lawsuit. So they, they removed that and they didn't win. Um, and then we had in 2020, the world rugby, and that was enormous. And thanks to Ross Tucker and I mean, all the people, Emma Hill and John Pike um, uh, all, and, and again, Nicola Williams, Fair Play for Women, everybody was there helping and the world rugby did it right. They allowed for an open debate uh, and they came up with the policy that indeed, if you allow a man into a woman's sport, into a woman's rugby game match, the chances of a woman having an injury to spine and back goes up maybe 30% or more. So that was very important. And, and I shared Fiona's shock and dismay that the, the rugby unions and the individual countries did not go along with that. That was uh, very shocking, but at least world rugby tried to do the right thing. And that was inspiring. And then in 2021, uh, we had the UK Sports Council's document that Fiona was talking about and, um, you know, with the idea, the conclusion that it was, it's impossible. It's impossible to balance safety and fairness with inclusion. You have to choose. It's very, it helps me in Canada make this argument at the federal level. When I go to national meetings now, I can say, look at those documents. You can't, you can't have it. You have to have either fairness and safety, or you have to have, or you do inclusivity. You can't have it all. You have to make a decision. And so that was a very important document, the UK uh, the SCAG document. Um, and, you know, uh, it also was encouraging to me in a really, you know, odd way uh, to read. Um, when I read about the employees, uh, I said many of the interviewees who held positions in sporting agencies said their personal opinions were in direct conflict with that of their employer. And they were they had to remain silent. There was frequent voiced frustration 
with regularly redu that regularly reduced into ease of tears and hostility. These are the emotions that I run into in Canada all the time as well. People do not agree with this, but they are feeling that they can't speak honestly. And so when we hear this happening to people in other countries, it is very, very helpful. It's encouraging because we know that we're not alone. Um, and then, of course, in 2021, near the end uh, of the uh, in November, was the McDonald Laurie Institute report thanks to John Pike, Emma Hilton, and uh, Leslie Howe, who authored this document. It was the first document in Canada of a major political think tank that went against the Center for Ethics and Sports proposals to, to have trans inclusion. So that happened on the week uh, th that report was released, the week that I had to go to national meetings in uh, FX Canada, and I believe it had a role to play in and us not having to, to adopt uh, in that meeting, the gender policy. So all of these things really have helped. And you know, through all, throughout all this time from 2019 to 22, we've had uh, USA, we've had Save Women's Sports, Best Elzer in USA helping with legislation. Uh, there are now 37 states that have at least initiated um, the trend like the protection of the women's sports category um and so like 37 states out of 50 you know they're gradually going up where even though the federal level wants to impose this this trans inclusivity the individual states are fighting so the 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 battle the battle is on the ground um and so you know um even like in canada we have we have individuals like alison sidor who's who's a, a, a Olympian, who very much uh, is writing letters. She's not really outspoken publicly, but she writes so many letters to the authorities in Canada, holding them to account all on her own. Um, I myself wrote a book uh, on sporting, um, and the, it's uh, how trans activism and science denial are destroying sport, uh, uh, Barbara Kay, uh, journalists in Canada assisted me with this book, uh, and a lot of people have been able to read it. A lot of coaches at the ground level have appreciated reading this. And um, so what I would like to say is um, that going for, one of the things that, that was really shocking and really for, for me uh, after the, the Laurel Hubbard affair in Tokyo, um, was that the um, Olympic Medical Commission, uh, Richard Budget said the IOC policy was not fit for purpose, purpose. And we had great hope that they would uh, consult finally with women and for with all these groups and experts that you've seen now that we've talked about, that, that the IOC would finally consult properly. And then we suddenly started show, it started uh, you know, the same thing as before, where, where they were only consulting with the trans activists, they were not consulting with women or with us. And it was it was very shocking. Um, and, you know, then this Leah Thomas uh, affair happens with all of the outcry and they, the NCAA insists on including this swimmer who is a male with the women um, despite the hue and cry, despite the fact that everybody is saying this is not correct, um, it's a very powerful ideology, obviously. Um, you know, for the Olympic Committee to actually continue down this road, um, it's, it's shocking because it actually contradicts the very Olympic Charter. The Olympic Charter itself, the um, item four in the Olympic Charter is that uh, Sports should be accessed by anybody without discrimination, and it does list biological sex in item six as one of the one of the um, characteristics upon which somebody should not be discriminated against. And and yet here they are, and they know they're discriminating against biological women. So you know it's uh, it's very very um, frustrating, um, and. You know, we have countries like Canada who has signed on to CETA, the Convention of uh, 
CEDA, which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And this was signed on by our country, and yet they completely ignore that, that aspect. And I guess as Fiona was pointing out, um, maybe part of it is that people in leadership forget the promises made by fathers and foremothers and people who were leaders uh, 20 years before. They forget. And maybe it's our job to remind them. And so I guess fighting, like going forward, I guess what I see here, here's what I see. The problem is poor leadership. Um, they, that the people who are in leadership, they, they wanted a quick solution. They didn't think it through. Um, and maybe they don't want to change now because either they're afraid, they're ignorant, they're, they have maybe even financial incentives. We're not sure. Um, and, you know, in the United States and Canada, especially, especially in Canada, United States, I don't know about other parts of the world, but we have this diversity, equity and inclusion dogma. And these entire departments, every university now has their bureaucracy of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these are the people that are arguing for um, just this irrational kind of forcing women to accept men in, in their spaces. Um, and so I think part of it is just, as Fiona said, it's, it's just um, leadership somehow being blind and not being willing to to contemplate or consider the plight of the female person in society um, that somehow we're just supposed to be accepting. Um, so what happens going forward? I, I feel like we're kind of at a pivot point. Now the world is starting to see what's really happening with these crazy policies. What's the real consequence of what happens when you put you know, a man into a woman's sport? Um, and so you know, it seems like we're going to have, I do agree with John and, and Fiona, we're going to have a struggle for the next decade or more. Uh, this, this ideology is far too entrenched. And I guess the thing is that there's a persistent failure of these top organizations, IOC, NCAA, to consider and to consult with women. So, you know, then that makes me think, you know, um, especially after seeing the result of what happened after Tokyo and, and the IOC just got crazier. Their new policy in November 2021, just a few months ago. Now it's up to us to prove that the ban has an advantage instead of them having to prove they don't have an advantage. Um, so it just keeps getting worse for, for the female athlete. And I guess the question then becomes who does? Who's, who speaks? Who is the person who speaks for women and girls? Who does that? Um, if the IOC did want to consult with women, who, who would they call? Who are the groups? Who are the people? I think that the solution going forward, we can have a solution to this. There has to be consultation. But women's groups around the world, we do, do need to get together. We need to get together. We need to speak with uh, unity, which is why it's fantastic to have an event like this. We need to speak with, with unity, with a voice, one voice. We have to have leadership. We have to have collaboration. We have to have long-term commitment to this fight because it's not going to be, you know, it's just going to be a marathon. It's not going to be overnight. And I really believe, I really believe it can be done. I believe that we are only at the beginning. This is a new phase. And um, we have a struggle, to, well, a war, a battle to fight on behalf of the female athlete. As John pointed out, a lot of them were told a lie. They're told a lie that the testosterone makes a difference. But I believe that we can get to the point where we have representation. There's a lot of smart women out there, a lot of great leaders in each country. Um, we need to get together and we need to figure out a way that we have a seat at the table every time a sports organization is going to talk about their policy, women, girls, people who care about the female athlete um, situation and, and fairness and safety need to be sitting at the table. There has to be a voice when these rules are discussed. It cannot only be the trans activists. So I am advocating very strongly that somehow in the future, we all have to work together to actually um, help formulate policy, 
and to hold the leadership of sports to account. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, my great thank to all the preparation and invitation to speak and the excellent preparation international classes I have to read and my English is not very perfect. Sorry for this. Besides my job, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I was one of the organizers of the hybrid lesbian spring gathering in Bremen in my 21. And we had to withstand a big shitstorm from trans and LGBT uh, groups, not least queer feminist lesbian organizations. However, we also got uh, a very great lesbian spring festival and a uh, lot of solidarity from feminists, lesbians from Germany and internationally. Um, my background is both sport feminist professor and uh, also lesbian feminist with long history now. I want to speak a little bit about the situation in Germany now, uh, with some aspects very shortly, of course. In Germany, there has only been isolated resistance to the queer agenda in sport as well. I'm glad there's more movement, especially in Spain and uh, with the international connection. Perhaps we learn of you all. Without going into the history of the development of sport in general and for women in particular, I would like to say that sport as an access to one's own body and also coming into contact with others can be an important, a really feminist source for girls, for all women, if it's tough well. And that is one great point, I think. But sport has also always been a decisive adjusting screw for political problems. We can see this in the history or history of Olympic sports, uh, in women's sports, special also under Nazi fascism or in the German Democratic Republic. In this respect, I think it's short-sighted to refer only to the different physical potentials of women and men according to the current state of science to argue against the trans and queer agenda. But I think it's very important what was and uh, Tommy are saying too. In a very brief overview, I try to give you an insight into the current situation regarding trans in the field of girls, women's and lesbian sport in Germany. To mention only a few effect areas, these are school sports for all girls and boys. Competitive high and high performance sport and recreational sport, which in broad sense also includes a long, long tradition of women's swimming pools and women's saunas for example. In Germany also it's a very big issue, the rehabilitation and disabled sports. Then since the 80s we have the family sports and self-defense context. Also the LGBTIQ sports context and which all uh, this is political resources in uh, the sport associations, in the uh, federal pol policies, and also in international context. Um, yes, very short. While the one hand, each of these areas have had their own long history and their own independent progress, we can uh, these days see a rapid development in very many places in Germany. Often wrapped in subclauses, subordinate sentences, in which the idea of an innate gender identity is being patched 
into the demand for acceptance and the full integration of lesbian and gays in ever more colorful ways. This also affects laws and regulations, suggestions or directives regarding the implementation of such demands and party political programs. These developments are often led by women in sports, women's associations, and by women professors in academia and in gender institutes doing research, research on sports or on health. Some of these associations and academic institutions were originally rather autonom uh, sorry, autonomously feminist, but have now developed in the direction of queer feminism since around the mid 19th. Today, their research and teaching increasingly focus on trans and LGBTIQ asterisks. The L, if research at all, is always denoted as queer and therefore as cis and transgender. Particularly in LGBTIQ studies, women as a sex are virtually absent and linguistically speaking, literally absent. The government of the Social Democrats, SPD, and the Greens, and the FDP, the Liberals, elected since autumn 2021, last year, as has an important plan to change the self-ID law as far as possible this year. This is already being enforced and advanced in many areas also, and very, very important, uh, not hearable uh, in the sports. In more and more government-sponsored brochures and recommendations for action, example for schools, the term sexual identities and the fight against homophobia and transphobia appear. The issues are mixed up without discussion the haste and the pressure put on is more than worrying. Thus, even the basic problems of alarmingly high numbers of sick, overweight and underweight, depressed, autistic, allergic children and other adolescents are not spe uh, yeah, specifically and topically being addressed by gender sport research. There's no, no new uh, programs. Developments in this area are not yet clear or feasible, nor has the impact been considered of the adamant demands by trans associations to have the German constitution. The, uh, an example is the basic law amended to include self ID. What we have is increasingly helpless parents new brochures and children's books about my trans child. This plays into the hand of right-wing groups in all of these areas at all levels and at the same time. So this is a very precious situation uh, now in Germany. In the schools in Germany, there's a massive increase in non-binary and queer girls. On the one hand, I take a little bit of positive view of this as a way to partly get out of the currently and newly narrowed binary uh, role body images and restricted options for the action. But on the other hand, many of them also because they want to be modern, and committed it to progress and up to the trans train. Currently, an estimate of 15 to 20 percent, and they get with 19 or 11 years the label dysphoria or the diagnosis. Body dysphoria is a drama therapeutic term whose seriousness has been almost turned into the opposite. Our newspapers and also the television 
online and print, all of daily reports about so-called trans kids. We cannot yet estimate the, speci the specific effects of all of this on sports in general and in all areas. In fact, this development promoted and networked it into associations and universities, especially with the German Sport University of Cologne, that is my home, <laughs> by the largest German and also largest European uh, LGBTQ sports club based in Berlin called Seitenwechsel Sportverein für Frauen, Lesben, Trans, Inter und Mädchen e.V. Um, in English, Changing Sites, Registered Sport Clubs for Women, Lesbian, Trans, Inter and Girls. I co-founded it in 1988 together with 10 other lesbian and women as a women lesbian as a women's lesbian girls sport association for a long long time the club the association developed impressively also internationally for participation in lesbian and gay sport games Uh, example was uh, uh, gay games, out games, etc. And designed, designed many approaches for lesbian women and especially for girls. This situation has now been totally queer for several years. Lesbian groups without trans are not, no longer possible. Possible trans men, trans women, or non binary queer persons coach professionally in all sections. Introductory pronoun rounds are the order of the day. It's not the time to speak about the gay games, but it's also a very uh, interesting changing. Uh, have a lit type. Okay. Um, For me, it's interestingly, a new development started in the late 1980s to mid 1990s, when women in sport become stronger and also stronger worldwide. One record after the next was set and more and more girls in countries of the global source got access to sport. It's striking that trans arrived in sports together with queer research taking place at a moment when women were becoming stronger and leaving many good men behind. Flo Jo, Griffith Joyner, or Martina Navaritelove, and a lot. And that this happened at the same time when an independent feminist, feminist form of sports and its approaches developed right into uh, universities. I was one of the theoretical and practical co-founders since 1982. Uh, some questions. How many girls can't throw? Not because they can't by nature, but because they don't learn the technique. If I can't throw and catch well, this affects my perception, my ability to move in space, and if necessary to define myself, which always has direct or indirect effects on my body feeling and body awareness. The questions are and have been, how can I develop genuine alternatives despite physical handicaps, disabilities and illness that are not just some form of rehabilitation? What are the chances and the limitation in both competitive and recreational sport and sports as a school subject for and with women with disabilities? How are lesbian approaches different, sometimes seemingly contrary to those of and for other women? All these questions uh, are with a queer, Uh, so-called intersectionality um, forms 
um, not questions. And I think that is one of the great problems. In queer feminist sports research, the deconstructed women's body is dissolved to the point of non-existence in the genderless identitarian queer. Ancient body knowledge, including, for example, around menstruation and pregnancy birth, is once again erased. To put it weakly, there are binders and mastectomies instead of positive female bodily experience while climbing trees and jumping over railings or sparrowly deflecting attacks or playing ball while dancing or canoeing or massage together. Uh, yes, I think uh, that's a very, very short overview from the situation in Germany we have now. Uh, we need more international and also in Germany more networking uh, to help and to uh, save the sport for girls, for women, for lesbians all together. Thank you very much. Plantearía un, uh, un, un par de preguntas, una a, India, a, a Linda, a Linda Blade. Eh, Linda, tú llevas eh, mucho tiempo en esta lucha. Eh, ¿Crees que en estos momentos, en 2022, eh, el mensaje que estás trasladando se entiende más? ¿O bien es más difícil porque existe una resistencia más activa y mayor presión eh, contra lo que planteas y con, contra lo que estáis trabajando? Bueno, um, I understand, but I have to speak in English. Uh, I don't have the Spanish words. Um, so, so, yes, um, I believe that we are getting, we're in a situation where for many years, trans um, activists had, nobody was saying anything, no, nobody was, um, was disagreeing openly. Now we have hope. We are disagreeing. We know no matter what happens, whether it's something on Twitter, whether it's a public uh, poll, about 70 to 80 percent of the public agrees with our position. And when we start speaking, what happens is they become stronger against us for a while. But when we start demanding evidence, they go away because they have no argument. As John pointed out, even Joanna Harper has changed her stance, his stance. I will say Joanna Harper is a self-identified uh, male. Uh, so Joanna Harper has basically uh, originally said taking testosterone or reducing testosterone would eliminate the advantage. Now, because that turns out to not be true, according to the science, then the, the argument changes to, oh, well, let's just make it all meaningful and let's just be nice. So the, the argument, when they finally have to argue their point, they are not good at it. They don't have facts on their side. They will be very loud and very um, even threatening sometimes. But we, the public, and all of us who care, we have to keep pushing because they are wrong and we are right. There's no doubt about it. Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. Y, y muchas gracias por, por vuestra lucha y, y, y por resistir. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Y, y gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias. No. Eh. Yeah. Buenas noches. Para, Buenas para... noches. <risa> <risa> Voy a dormir ahora.